Dr. Abernathy, residents of Resurrection City, and my fellow citizens. I stand here today with many mixed emotions. For it was five years ago that my late husband, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., stood in this very spot and told the nation about his dream. Yesterday marked the 15th wedding anniversary for me and my late husband. Your presence here today indicates to me your great love, devotion, and dedication to those ideals which my husband set forth in his dream and which you will continue to follow through until they are fulfilled. I want to thank all of you from all over this nation who have come here in support of this Solidarity Day. I want to especially thank the National Urban League under the direction of Dr. Whitney Young, and especially Mr. Sterling Tucker, the coordinator of this Solidarity Day, for the tremendous support that you have given the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in order to make this occasion possible. Now, I know Dr. Abernathy would do this, but I want to tell you how much it means to me personally because it was my husband who conceived the idea of a Poor People's Campaign. And now I should like to read to you a telegram which I received from another lady who was just recently victimized by the same tragedy which my family and I were victimized by. Today, on this most important day for all Americans, my heart and prayers are with you. The finest memorial to Dr. Martin Luther King would be the tangible action our country takes now to implement the programs he and my husband cared about so deeply. Signed, Mrs. Ethel Kennedy. Mrs. King is preparing to sing a hymn. She's just spoken tribute to her late husband. And she's now going to sing.
It is fitting and proper that we come again to the Lincoln Memorial, this symbolic and historic spot where we have come several times before to present our case to the President, to the Congress of the United States, and to the American people. We are here because we feel a frightful sense of urgency to rectify the long-standing evils and injustices in our society. Racism, poverty, and war. The Poor People's Campaign was conceived by my late husband, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., as America's last chance to solve these problems nonviolently. The sickness of racism, the despair of poverty, and the hopelessness of war have served to deepen the hatred, heighten the bitterness, increase the frustration, and further alienate the poor in our society. The rumblings of discontent from the disinherited, downtrodden, and dispossessed of our society have finally become united around the issue of poverty. The least of these, God's children, have been ill-housed, ill-fed, deprived of adequate jobs and educational op opportunities, and barred from full participation in the political life of this nation. Washington, seeking to better their conditions, and in so doing, they are dramatizing this nation, to this nation and to the world, the desperateness of their plight. In a nation so rich in natural resources and material wealth, the richest nation in the world, a nation founded on the principles of justice and equality for all. Some 30 million of its citizens are denied access to the wealth that surrounds them. I'm speaking of the American Indians, the Mexican Americans, the Puerto Ricans, black Americans, and the white poor who all live below the poverty line. Too long have we uttered pious platitudes and made faulty promises to our less fortunate brothers. Our destiny is tied up with their destiny, and we are being forced to place the issues where they belong, squarely on the conscience of the American people. All of the problems we face in trying to build a community and a nation of brotherhood which we need desperately, can be attributed to, to what I call the triple evils of our time. Racism, poverty, and war. All three of these evils can be reduced to violence. We can therefore say that violence is the disease which threatens to destroy the basic fabric of which our society is woven the undergirding fabric of love, understanding, justice, and peace. Racism in American society can be traced to the period of slavery in this country, when it was felt that black persons were completely inferior to white persons. Perhaps racism can be traced to that dark period in our history when slavery became institutionalized for 244 years, and segregation was practiced for another 100 years. So you see, the roots of racism are very deep in the psyche of the American white man. All forms of economic, 
political, social, educational, and religious exclusion of the black man from the mainstream of society can be attributed to racism. Therefore, racism means being deprived of human dignity, self-respect, and equal opportunities in education, of jobs, of decent housing, political and social endeavors. Extreme hatred and bitterness against the black man has been shown by the white man due to his racist tendencies. Often this hatred has manifested itself in the violence of lynchings and murders by which many Negroes and white civil rights workers have been victimized. To say nothing of the crippling effects of segregation and discrimination which have been experienced. Racism is related to poverty in that it is easy to display racist attitudes toward a, toward a minority group, whether they be black, red, brown, or young. When we talk about poor people, we are dealing with the class structure of society. Therefore, the poor whites are similarly affected. The difference between the poor whites and the poor blacks, red, yellow, and or brown, is that it is possible for the white poor to lose their identity as they become more affluent because they do not carry the stigma of color as the society would refer to it. Poverty can produce the most deadly kind of violence. In this society, violence against poor people and minority groups is routine. I remind you that starving a child is violence. Suppressing a culture is violence. Neglecting school children is violence. Punishing a mother and her child is violence. Discrimination against a working man is violence. Ghetto housing is violence. Ignoring medical needs is violence. Contempt for poverty is violence. Even the lack of willpower to help humanity is a sick and sinister form of violence. The violence of war is understood by everyone. There is hardly a family which has not been victimized by the effects of war in that a husband, a father, a son, or a brother has been wounded or killed in the line of duty. What a nonsensical and cruel way to try to resolve conflicts. In recent months, when we as a nation have experienced the loss of two of the great men of our time through violent means, we have come to realize and understand the broad dimensions of violence in our society. The problems of racism, poverty, and war can all be summarized with one word, violence which seems to be fashionable in our society. If we do not stop this madness, we will certainly destroy ourselves and the whole world. There is need for a creative approach to the cru crucial problems which we face in our nation and in the world. I believe firmly that the women of our country have been called at this hour to furnish the kind of forthright, honest, dedicated and creative leadership necessary to bring about positive solutions to the difficult problems we face. The approach must be the nonviolent approach, for the means must be in keeping with the end. Because these problems of our society, which I have discussed, affect the women of this nation so deeply, I believe that they will see the necessity of joining a campaign of conscience in which all ethnic groups 
all religious persuasions, all economic circumstances, and all cultural backgrounds will unite to produce a solid block of woman power. And seeking solutions to the three evils of racism, poverty, and war, it is clear that there is need for a renewal of the great spiritual and moral insights embedded in our cultural heritage. We must dedicate and rededicate ourselves to making a society based on the principles of love, truth, nonviolence, justice, and peace. This does mean a kind of rethinking and reordering of values and priorities. Women, if the soul of this nation is to be saved, I believe that you must become its soul. You must speak out against the evils of our times as you see them. Those of us women who have been blessed with the privilege of bearing children have the sacred task of rearing them with a knowledge and understanding of our democratic heritage and the eternal values of love, justice, mercy, and peace. As women and mothers, we have a common concern for the happiness of our children and their families to unite our efforts throughout the world. We must compel those governments which ignore human dignity, which deny freedom of the individual, which block social progress and national independence to put an end to every sort of persecution. Somehow we must rid ourselves of racism and teach our children the meaning of true brotherhood. Our children must be taught to be concerned about and to develop a deep sense of appreciation for those who are less fortunate than themselves, the least of these. They must know that all of society is interrelated. What affects one directly affects all indirectly. Women must realize that the war in Vietnam is the most crucial and evil war in the history of mankind. <laughs> and that they have a moral obligation to oppose it. If enough women spoke out against the Vietnam War and stood firm in their opposition, even to being willing to go to jail if necessary, I think it would make a tremendous impact on the president and the policy makers of this nation. If we stop the war four months, and one day sooner, we could eliminate the need for 10% surcharge tax. We could create 400,000 new jobs with the money we would save if we stopped the war 14 minutes sooner. If we stopped the war two months sooner, we could build 300,000 new housing units with the money. One hour of war could buy your community a new school, hospital, or cultural center. All of this is to say that a guaranteed income, a job for those who need a job, could be had if the war was stopped and the will created by our government to act on behalf of its deprived citizens.
all excited. I can't see much emotion here today. Women, I urge you to call upon the president to stop the bombing of Vietnam now in order that a settlement of the war can be negotiated. If we are to survive this dip, dreadful period of social change, we must adhere tenaciously to the philosophy of nonviolence. We, the women, must lead the way in adopting nonviolence as a way of life. We must teach our children the nonviolent way so as to stop the chain of violence which is spiraling in our society. The first step is to recognize the power of love. It is the answer to all of the problems which mankind faces. Love is the key to understanding. Love is the only force that can destroy hate. If we act now, we still have a chance. Our choice is between nonviolent coexistence and violent co-annihilation. The road to justice, peace, and brotherhood is difficult. We must renew our strength, increase our faith, and gird our courage. In the words of the black poet, the late Langston Hughes, a black mother counsels her son to keep faith in the future. In her ungrammatical profundity, she speaks, Well, son, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor, bare. But all the time I's been up climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you sit down on the steps cause you finds it's kind of hard. Don't you stop now. For I still go in, honey. I still climb. And life for me ain't been no crystal stair.